Health Watch. A cutting edge clinical trial has made huge strides in efforts to cure sickle cell anemia. It's a disease that causes some red blood cells to change into sickle shapes and then die. Dr. John LaPook followed Janelle Stevenson and others for more than a year as they underwent a new kind of gene therapy at the National Institutes of Health. Together, they watched the 60 minute piece about their process. Take a look. What do you think? It's a lot of information to take in. There's the big positive outcome, which we all hope for, but then there's the risk that you have to weigh in as well, which can be very intimidating, but it's a step in the right direction. Shireen, when Janelle was describing her pain, and especially when she was describing not being believed that she was in pain, you were shaking your head like that. Because that's, that's happened to me a few times, going to the hospital and stating, this is the disease I have, this is the pain that I'm in, and they didn't understand. And so they thought I was there just to get payments. I actually wanted to cry during that part because you're not believed at all, and nobody could understand what was happening for me. Have you guys experienced the same Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. Yes. Definitely. And your reactions were, you know, surprisingly, like, not exactly what I expected. How so? Um, I guess I was expecting a little more, like, excitement. Uh, excitement. <laughs> because we've talked about gene therapy and the downside it's really profound and scary but I think seeing how you reacted um, you know I'm still as enthusiastic yeah. as ever what were the scary parts to you you want to say the number one thing yes yeah. once we heard the HIV right. thing, you know. so I can tell you right now that that HIV virus has been disabled it's been crippled so it cannot infect you it cannot the part of it that allows it to infect you is gone the reason why it's used is that it's very good at transferring DNA into a cell. Because I could guarantee everybody felt the same. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it's exciting to know that we're making breakthrough. And yes, there's a lot of unknown variables as to what's going to happen five years from now. The other thing that, you know, a little bit worrisome or scary is, uh, you know, sickle cell has become part of my identity. It's who I am and what I know. And I think without the sickle cell, I would not have some of the characteristics I, I have, even if it's down to my resilience or my determination. And it, it would be once you're cured, trying to find out who you really are, who are you now? Dealing with it every day, you know, dealing with the struggles that come along with it. It's like, that's, that's what drives us. That's what drives us to stay strong, to keep moving. For me, they kind of gave me more of hope and this gave me a, a chance to feel like I had a choice now. I'm very optimistic. The possibility of a cure, that's an, a, that's an amazing thing. Even though I say I may have the fear of who I'm going to be, does not mean that if that opportunity was not offered to me that I wouldn't take it. It's just something that I would have to really think about. Think about. So Dr. John LaPook and uh, Janelle Stevenson are joining us uh, now. Now, those people who are watching the, your story, Janelle, are people with sickle cell reacting to it. And, you know, the comment was that the reaction was sort of subdued. And when I think about sickle cell, you hardly... You really don't hear a lot about it in terms of, like, the search for a cure. You hear about right. different cancers. There's all these sort of campaigns. But sickle cell affects African Americans. And I think that's led to sort of uh, limited exposure. How are you, do you understand their trepidation? I, I do, mm -hmm. but in the same sense, I knew for me, that was the only option. Mm -hmm. I was gonna do it no matter what, regardless of the risks or any adverse effects it may have on me. I knew that the way I was living then was not the way I wanted to live the rest of my life. Yeah. So I wanted to take the chance. She talked about the pain as being bone crushing. I mean, what a term to use. Yeah, because because describe your life, the life that you're talking about, what you were living and how you were feeling. It was pain every single day. Wake up in pain. It might not be very profound, but, but you live with it. Every day every there's like the a day. little baseline pain that you know it's there. It reminds you every day that you have sickle cell and it makes me cautious of what I accomplished that day. And where in your body were you having the pain? Everywhere. Mm. Like my face, my cheekbones, my back, my arms, my shoulders, every possible part of your body could hurt. Doctor, give us a breakdown of, you know, how this gene therapy works, why it's been successful. Well, it's a technological tour de force. Yeah. And to think, when, you, when you're wondering, why should we do all this basic research, this basic science, they took an HIV virus and they disabled it but they used it because it's really good at, at transferring DNA into a cell. And they took a, a, a copy of a gene. You know, the problem is one letter in all the billions, 
one letter, a T that should have been an A in the genetic code. Mm -hmm. And they, they fixed it, they corrected a gene in the outside of her body, they put it in her stem cells, and then they gave her chemotherapy to get rid of her own uh, stem cells that were making the bad red blood cells, and they transferred in the good stem cells, and how long did it take before you felt something? Just a couple of days. Wow. I started, I started <laughs> a couple of days. I started to feel those cells engrafting in my body. So describe that feeling. You, you talked about being constantly in pain, and then describe how you felt two weeks after the therapy. Um, to about two weeks after, I could still feel those engrafting cells, and I knew it wasn't sickle cell pain because it was a completely different type of pain. This one almost tickled a little bit. I was like, oh, that's the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you got the good so, stuff. Yeah. yeah. So after that, once that was done, my body just was on up, it went up. Like a, uh, you, you were talking about the description of being, of going from what, I guess, like a jalopy to a Maserati <laughs> when, <laughs> when you had that therapy, yes. right? You were jalopy before, yes. sort of broken down, huffing and puffing, yes. and then now you're this well-oiled machine tackling life. I've always had, I felt, like a very bubbly personality, but I never had I the body. I can't tell at all, <laughs> I never had the body to match that, and now we just brought the I body up, and you. everything's cohesive. I feel like, okay, now I'm Janelle. Before, that was just a part of me waiting to break out. Right. Now I'm Janelle. So now Janelle is Janelle, and yes. she's a medical miracle. But what about for other people? Well, for other people, the hope is that you can scale it, right? So yeah. you can't give millions of people chemotherapy, but I was speaking to Dr. Francis Collins, head of the NIH, and to Dr. John Tisdale, who headed up this program, and they said that there's research right now that looks very promising where all you have to do, for example, is give an antibody. You don't have to give the chemotherapy. You give an antibody, gets rid of her own stem cells that are about to grow up into the bad red blood cells, and then maybe even the next day get the stem cells that have the good copies of the gene in it, your blood count doesn't ever go down. You may not even feel it, and off you go. That is an amazing possibility, because then you're talking about scaling it up for the millions of people around the world who, who have this. And I have to say, on a personal basis, I mean, for me, you know, there's the physician, there's the journalist, and sometimes they, they do brush up against each other. And when I was in medical school, so 1976 to 1980, and then for about six years after that, I was taking care of a lot of people with sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. You graduate medical school and you think, I'm gonna cure people. And then you go out and you can do nothing. I mean, mm -hmm. I felt so helpless. Uh, you could give them pain medicines, not much more. You could hold their hand, you could listen to them. And I can tell you their names still, all these years later. I became close to them. Uh, there's one person in particular, I, I'm not gonna say his name, but he was an artist. Um, and all these years later, you know, I, I, it still is very emotional for me to even think about that time when I, I could do nothing. And now fade out, fade in. It's more than 40 years later since I entered medical school. And there's Janelle being slammed down to the ground and popping up. Whereas in the past, I mean, I think if she'd been slammed down, and you, remember those candies? You, you, you put them in the, in the freezer and you slam right, them down, right, they would right. break Turkish yeah. taffy yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, right. I mean, that's what I was thinking when she was slammed down and she just popped back up. And I, that's why there's this moment in the 60 Minute piece where I go, Janelle, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. it was like, oh my gosh. The elation. Hey, listen, um, doctor, you know, a ton of people are gonna be watching this and right, they're yeah. gonna wanna know, you know, how can I get on, right. you know, if, if it's a research study or how can I get involved in this? If you go to our website, uh, we have links to the National Institutes of Health. They'll tell you how to get in touch. Um, right now, they can only take about three or four people a week, but they're setting up consortium across the country. Uh, they're trying to gear up. And by the way, um, they've manned and womened <laughs> the, uh, the switchboard so that uh, they're ready for your calls and they're, they're ready for you to apply. You apply, and depending upon your medical history and, and various factors, maybe you're a candidate to get into it. So I think there's hope for this. And this is the real deal. I mean, I know we get, we hype things sometimes. Yeah. Right, I'm all, sure. You know me, right? Yeah, I'm very, sure. cautious. very cautious. Yeah. cautious. Very cautious. I'm en fuego. Yeah, on this one. no, because Anne Marie's right. Deal. There's 15 million plus, 20 million people that watch 60 Minutes every week. And I'm sure that there's going to be thousands of, of families who are affected by sickle cell anemia and are going to want to know how can I. And there are 7,000 other genetic diseases that you could think about treating and potentially curing with this. So. It's the beginning of, of an exciting era. You know new what I keep thinking about with you, Janelle, is that, you know, I had a friend in high school who passed away mm -hmm. who had sickle cell. And, and the idea that at one point we thought she had a future and realized very quickly there was no future. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, now, you have an, an incredible future. Yes. I mean, that must change everything about how you plan your life, your dreams, everything. Absolutely. Um, for me right now, it's about just living in the now. Because before, I was always planning, because I never knew 
how much time I had. And yeah. I was always planning, what do I want to accomplish? What do I want to do? And now, I just want to live. <laughs> she she said that when she was 22, she had the thought, oh, I'm kind of at middle age. Correct. Yeah. Which is a very chilling very, thought. Yeah, but it's hard to It's, a, it's very hard when I said that out loud and came to that realization, this is a very tough disease. Yeah. Yeah. But, but look at her now. Look at you now. Look at you now. Amazing. It's real. Congratulations. What a beautiful story. Yeah, thanks uh, a lot. Thank you for coming on and sharing it with us. Thanks, Henry.